We wish to acknowledge this land in which the Fields Institute operates for thousands of years. It's been the traditional land of the Huron Wendat, the Seneca, and the Mississaugas of the Credit. Today, this meeting place is still the home to many indigenous people from across Turtle Island, and we're grateful to have the opportunity to work on this land. And I'll give it over to Zhen Hong to introduce our speaker today. Great. I'm very pleased to, I'm very excited to have uh, a mathematical moderator of all uh, uh, to speak in this uh, colloquium series today. And uh, Gege, uh, Professor Roost is, uh, is a dear colleague and collaborators, uh, and uh, we consider him a, a part of the m ph network. Uh, I think he's a long honorable member of this network. And um, Gege uh, is uh, currently uh, directing, I think he's the inaugural director of the National Laboratory for Health Security of the Hungarian government. He has been leading uh, the Hungarian COVID-19 mathematical modeling and uh, epidemiological analysis task force. Academically, he is uh, uh, chair of the Department of Applied and Numerical Mathematics of uh, University of Segate and vice head of the Borea Institute. Um, given that, and uh, Gege, so uh, it's your time. Thank you very much for the introduction and thank you so much for the opportunity that I can talk in this colloquium series. So today uh, I'm planning to give uh, an overview uh, of the work that has been done during the pandemic by the Epidemiological Task Force in Hungary, Modeling and Epidemiological Task Force. Uh, how this work, how this task force was formed, what we did, how we worked, what was achieved. And uh, as you can see in the title, I added the a phrase, a Canadian story. So at the end of the presentation, I will also talk a little bit about how the task force has its roots actually in Canada. So uh, I also want to acknowledge my, my colleague, Beatrix Orossi, who was the lead epidemiologist in the task force. So he worked on a daily basis for two years during the pandemic. And she was uh, leading the group of epidemiologists in the task force. So let me go uh, back to the very beginning of this pandemic when uh, end of January 2020 or early February, when there were only a few cases uh, around the world outside China. Uh, you can see here on the map, like four cases in Canada only. Uh, and then everybody was concerned about uh, the potential global spread of this virus. So we already started, task force didn't exist at that time, but with our group at the university, we already started to do some modeling about uh, the potential of this becoming a, a global pandemic. So we published published the, this paper uh, when we basically just connected three, two, three types of models. One was uh, to, to estimate expected case numbers in China, assuming uh, intensifying control measures. And then we uh, connected this to global mobility network to see how many of these cases can show up at other places around the world using a large database on, on global mobility. And then each of these cases that appeared somewhere else could start potentially an epidemic by a branching process. And we could estimate this way the probability of an outbreak. And then we could make a kind of risk assessment based on travel volume data between the regions in the world for European countries. And this already that time identified Italy, which became a second hotspot as a potential a high risk country for being the next hotspot after China. And a journalist from New Scientist actually read this paper and she contacted me and asked the following question. So at that time, it was in February, a few cases were observed in different countries, also in Canada, uh, cases who arrived from Iran. And at that time, there were only very few cases reported officially in Iran. So the journalist asked me a question, can we do this uh, estimation method backwards? So to, to see, uh, 
we see this number of imported cases from Iran, can we make an estimation how many infected people could be Iran, in Iran? So then it's a very simple calculation which gave an estimation there should be at least 2,000 cases to see these kind of importations. And later on in Hungary, there was no cases in Hungary at that time, but later the first cases were actually student, university students who were returning from Iran. So, and then uh, by that time, it became clear that Iran was also in a very bad uh, situation. So it became, and it became then a major media news at that time that it was already uh, by mathematical calculations, it was already predicted some weeks ahead that there will be large outbreak. In, uh, there is already a large outbreak in Iran, despite official numbers were very low. So, and then uh, just to show this, stru this structure of the operational task force to see how complicated it was. Uh, it was formed in, in at the end of January by Hungarian government. Uh, and in the bottom, you can see kind of action groups. These action groups were formed in March, uh, so later. And this was mostly various government branches of executive branches of government, major medical healthcare institutions, uh, and so on. And mostly about uh, uh, logistical and other executive issues. Uh, and the science, is a very small part of this large structure in under Ministry of Innovation and Technology. Uh, here, we had, there were two uh, action groups, scientific action groups. One was virology group and one was epidemiology and modeling group. And this was only scientific input into this very complicated uh, structure. So our action group or task force uh, had this, this structure. It basically had three major pillars. One was modeling and simulations. One was surveillance and, and epidemiology. And one was kind of big health data. Uh, and it was multidisciplinary expert group. Uh, many fields of expertise were represented in the group from mathematics to medicine, data science, biostatistics, epidemiology, and even social sciences. and uh, it, it included a bit more than 50 people, 50 researchers in this group. Uh, so it was very new in Hungary to have such a multidisciplinary group, like not like in Canada, when you have long, long traditions of setting up multidisciplinary groups going back to maybe 20 years or more. In Hungary, it was a very new thing. Uh, and it had a core group, roughly a dozen people who worked basically day and night on this almost through two, two years. So of course, to epidemic modeling, there are several methods and approaches that we can use. Uh, and of course, we know that there is no, no one single model that explains everything. So it's best to try to use all these approaches when you want to answer different types of questions. So we also uh, use different uh, or many types of models and approaches and methods. So before I go into, uh, let me say a few words about what in general, kind of philosophical a bit, uh, what is the role of mathematical modeling in this whole uh, decision-making system? Uh, of course, most people are interested in, in forecasts and predictions, uh, and of course, and I will, I will have a special section about this at the, at the end of the talk. But of course, modeling is very useful for many other things. And maybe for me, not forecasts are the most important. So uh, to explain what is happening, why is this happening, give insight about the disease dynamics, what factors are governing the epidemic, to understand the trade-offs. Uh, even there are some examples that modeling guided data collection, so modeling showed showed that something's wrong about data collection and how you should rectify these uh, errors in data collection. Also to explore scenarios for possible interventions, also evaluate past interventions and these kind of things, and generally to expand the evidence basis for decision-making. Uh, here's one, one notable figure from uh, November, 2020, 
this figure was presented at the highest high level meeting with the prime minister. So this was uh, our second wave and prediction was made at this early November at this blue line. And the squares are the hospitalization data. So people treated in hospitals by COVID. And of course the data was uh, added later. At that time we had only up to this line and basically it was two major curves. One was what we could expect without and the discussion was should we include should we introduce strict measures at that time or not and there were these two options one is what we expect without any further measures and there was a proposition for a package of measures and here we estimated uh, the solid curve that would happen if these measures introduced and then you can see the measures were, the decision was made that they introduced this package of measures and the peak size of the epidemic of this wave was pretty much the same as was predicted by this. And of course, later you can see it becoming more inaccurate, but here in January, we already have the rising of the alpha variant, which was not <clears throat> in play when, the, when the, the charts were made in November. So the way the group worked is that we provided a compiled detailed analysis every week, situation report, risk assessment, uh, and it was a background material for cabinet meetings. We had weekly briefing with the, the ministry, uh, also ad hoc meetings when it was necessary. Uh, we presented scenarios for various control measures later for reopening scenarios and special reports it was needed so overall uh i, I counted once we presented more than ten thousand powerpoint slides and we even wrote the guideline to corporations and companies how they can uh, how they can prepare and mitigate the effects of the pandemic so what kind of things we did? So like, like everywhere else, it was very important to track the, the, the reproduction number, the effective reproduction number. So that was one of the things we did continuously and, and reported how the reproduction number changes. Uh, we created this, this is the map of Hungary, uh, spatial, spatial epidemiological reports uh, identifying clusters and how these clusters move or change week by week in the country. Also clusters for high, high, high risk, which are high risk for mortality. Uh, also, of course, track the cases by uh, age, by disease severity, so hospitalized, severe, uh, ventilated patients, and also monitored the deaths a daily number of deaths due to COVID and also compared it with the, uh, so the relative daily mortality. Uh, so compared to daily, the standard daily, daily mortality to the actual one. So we, we also calculated uh, excess mortality and to, also to compare Hungary with other countries, we calculated this for all. Uh, European Union. So here you can see, for example, in the map, this is cumulative excess mortality during the pandemic. And you can see this east, more or less this east-west gradient uh, in excess mortality. Uh, this one is here, Hungary, or this is in this chart, the blue one, uh, or how the cumulative mortality changed over the course of the pandemic, this big, uh, upward steps here are the, the waves. So first in the first wave, actually we had fewer deaths, uh, overall deaths than pre-pandemic. So we had very strong measures in the first wave and basically epidemic was suppressed at that time. So excess deaths was actually negative. And then there was a second wave was quite large, third wave, fourth wave, and fifth wave, the Omicron wave, of course, some excess mortality but not that much so we also presented this heat maps so basically uh 
the heat map showed that at a given week, how many cases we have in different age groups and presenting them way gives visual, very good visual information uh, about the underlying mechanism. So in the first wave, you can hardly see the number of cases. It was very small. And then the second wave, you can see it started in socially active young adult age groups. And it took some weeks until it reached the elderly age groups. And the, on the third wave, in contrast, started uh, at the workplaces in middle-aged groups and then spread to younger and other age groups. And of course, the deaths, as you can see, were concentrated on elder age groups. So we see a different picture for the Omicron wave. So this is, uh, we had a school closure in Hungary for holidays uh, around Christmas and New Year's Eve. So at around this time, schools reopened and you could see this bright line here, which is huge Omicron wave in the schools. Uh, so it went through the schools. And then you can also see the other bright line here, which is a one generation gap. So these are basically the parents of school children. And then went through the schools, then went through the parents, and then through the parents, it was dispersing to other age groups later. So we also tracked a, a, large, a number of uh, epidemiological indicators, how they changed, uh, especially when there were some change in the measures, even restrictions or relaxations, how the measures, uh, how these indicators were different prior to and after the, uh, the change in, in measures. We had a large part of our work was collecting uh, social data. We had a, a special group for that. Uh, we had an online, uh, a web, online questionnaire on this website. It was quite popular. We had large campaigns uh, to encourage people to fill out the online questionnaire. In the questionnaire, we asked several types of questions. Uh, the most important one was we tried to construct the contact matrices. So how many contacts there are between individuals in different age groups. But also we asked a lot of other questions about mask wearing, travels, uh, using public transportation and so on, and later about testing or vaccination when they become available. So also produce these infographics to make this more interesting for people. And one, as I mentioned, one task was, or one goal was to construct the contact matrices. So this is the, the classical research in this topic is the polymod study from 15 years ago, when for eight European countries uh, collecting diaries from participants in the research, they, they generated this contact matrices for different countries, but Hungary was not included in the polymod study. And anyway, during the pandemic, of course, contact structure completely changed. So, uh, Generally, these contact matrices are break, can be uh, co uh, broken down into four, four major components. Contacts at home, you can see this very strongly diagonal structure in contacts at home. So people have contact with uh, others of the same age or with one generation gap. So these are uh, children, parents, interactions in these sub diagonals. Uh, at the school, we have most contacts in, of course, in school children, the workplace, mostly in the middle age groups, and there are other contacts related to leisure uh, and so on. So the, this online questionnaire, what we had, one, one thing we could reconstruct from the questionnaire is this contact matrices. And actually it was answered by 300,000 people. So population is 10 million. So 3% of the whole country answered at least once a questions in the online question. So then basically we had kind of real time tracking of contact numbers. And even when there was a relaxation in the regulation, for example, in, in a, after the first wave, they relaxed the measures in two phases. Uh, once in the, everywhere in Hungary, except the central region, Budapest, and two weeks later, they also relaxed in Budapest. So we could also, of course, track Budapest contact data with other regions contact data. And so we could see immediately when the measures were relaxed, in a few hours, we could see the change in contact numbers. 
from this series. So, as I mentioned, we collected data on lots of other uh, aspects. I will show some. Uh, and of course, it became clear that even though thousands of people were answering the question, it was still not a representative sample for the whole population. So we also started to collect representative samples or representative surveys every month, uh, which are these blue black dots here. And as we could see, uh, it followed very nicely the online questionnaire up to some point. So in the later phase of the pandemic, we didn't have many people filling up the form. So after one more than a year, one and a half years, of course, people get bored of this. But in the first few, in the first year of the pandemic, it was very popular and very useful. And we could basically follow real time the change in contact numbers. And of course, since it was not representative, we have to calibrate uh, uh, what we can we can extract from this many things. So this in the in the animation, maybe you can see the drastic drop in travels between cities in Hungary during the first wave, or in the in the top left figure, what we collected here is the we extracted here is the we call them critical contacts. So there was a period when disease was spreading mostly in young adult age groups but of course we know higher highest risk are the elderly so we specially tracked contacts between younger and elderly people and you can see it has very different patterns uh, if you compare central hungary at budapest and the, the capital and its area to rural hungary and in rural hungary there are much more contacts between young young and old people so that had implication that in uh, in rural areas uh, the disease can reach the elderly faster actually than in, than in other regions. So uh, here here you can see the number of people who filled out the questionnaire at some for a long period it was above one thousand responses per day, and then in the first wave and then between waves there were fewer interest. And then for second wave, it again, we had hundreds. And of course, you can see at the end of the third wave, people were losing interest. But all, all the country was basically represented. We even have a smartphone application where people could fill out the questionnaire. And here, just you can see how it was not representative. So for example, uh, these columns here are the general population with respect to age, for example, here where I show, and as you can see, uh, elderly age group at the beginning was very underrepresented. Uh, also, uh, also by education, for example, people with university degrees are 22% in the population, but they are a majority in those who filled out the questionnaire. So it was, uh, was not not representative, so you have to weight the answers to make to create a representative contact matrix, and we develop this method, uh, iterative weighting method, and then we could be calibrated every month to the to the monthly survey. We reweighted the answers from the online survey, and to make it more representative for our calculations. And also, we were the partners. There was a European wide study, a different data collection. Uh, uh, initiative to, to collect social data, social contact data from 21 European countries. It was the Comics Europe working group, but it went just for a few months in each country. So uh, couldn't give such a long-term picture that the other research. So one, which I think very interesting ap application of this uh, Contact, contact matrix collection effort is that combining with the A-structured compartmental model, we could also estimate the effective reproduction number RT, which is the dark blue curve, just from what people answered about their contact numbers, uh, plus modeling to, uh, to estimate uh, level, of, level of susceptibility and immunity in the population. So what we can see, the, the light blue is 
what one can with standard methods obtain estimation for the reproduction number from raw reported case data. And you can see at some periods they match very nicely. In other periods, they give very different uh, values. And actually, when there is a huge mismatch between the two, these are situations when we actually know uh, that the, the official case data was biased. For example, we had a period here uh, when you can see the by the case number data, we, you could find, you could guess that reproduction number already decreased to one, but for we know that we reach the limitation of our testing capacities. So that's the reason there were not more cases reported day by day. Uh, but by tracking the people's contacts and combined with the models, we could, we could see that reproduction number was still above, way above one. And then later, of course, it was reflected in hospitalization and that's data also that this was the better estimator. And also in some other situations, we had some special screening programs. Then we had, of course, large cases detected uh, in a short period of time that also distorted uh, the estimation of the reproduction number. Or also when we have for a period in, in the summer holiday season, we have very low case numbers, domestic case numbers, but we have relatively many imported cases. And then of course, imported cases, uh, if it is not cleared out from the from the database, they also distort the estimation of the reproduction number. So overall, this shows that just by a very large scale social survey, you can estimate the reproduction number quite well, and in sometimes even better than uh, than the standard surveillance would uh, give you. So we also. When vaccination was available, we also collected data on vaccine uh, attitudes towards vaccination. So we can track, for example, the rejection rate, and it was quite high at the beginning when vaccine was not even available at this point, but vaccine rejection was around 35%. And then when we have significant waves, rejection rate went down. Uh, and we could see it's interesting, there was this rebound in rejection rate during the summer period and very low case numbers during the summer. So again, more people were rejecting the vaccine if they didn't feel the risk. And then when uh, another wave started again, the rejection rate went down again. So the, the, the dashed curve is the epidemic curve and the, the blue one is rejection rate. So we also asked why people reject the vaccination. Uh, it was an open question, which was the answers recorded later. Uh, so half of them, roughly half of them mentioned side effects. A third of them underestimated uh, the danger posed by the virus. They thought it's not so, or I'm very healthy. I will, I will not get infected. I have strong immune system, or it's just something like a flu. I don't have to be afraid of this, this kind of answers some health reasons like i have already i've already been infected and i have high antibody levels or i'm pregnant or i have some other disease which doesn't uh, allow me to get the vaccine was the 12 percent and only seven percent of those rejected the vaccines mentioned some reasons which we could categorize as uh, strongly anti-vaccination stance uh, or conspiracy theory or some denial and to our surprise, quite a few people answered that they lack information or distrust the information. So uh, we also asked, so we had the system. I think this is a very interesting graph here. So in Hungary, we had the system that uh, vaccination. So we had, first of all, we used six types of vaccines and uh, four of them was in the framework of European Union's vaccine program, Pfizer, Moderna, AstraZeneca, and Johnson & Johnson. The later one is not included here because it was used in a very few quantities. And also we had a large amount of vaccines uh, produced in Russia and in China, and which were usually not, which are not used in other European countries. So people had the choice. So when, when, when uh, family doctor received a batch of vaccines. Uh, he informed the patients uh, 
uh, in, in the district that they can come and take it. And they had the choice that uh, they, they get the vaccine, which was available at that time, or they wait for another type of vaccine. Maybe they have to wait two weeks, three weeks. It was not uh, very clear how long, but somebody could potentially reject the vaccine at that time, which arrived to the doctor first and waited until another type of vaccine arrived and then took the other one. So we asked also people about the, the, this, which type of vaccine they rejected and which one they took afterwards. So in these arrows, the width of the arrows actually represent the number of people making these choices. So the largest, uh, the most people who are sw were switching, re rejecting one vaccine but accepting another was those who rejected the Sinopharm later accepted Pfizer. But generally, Pfizer was very popular. So people rejected those Sputnik, AstraZeneca just to get Pfizer later. But there were also some people who rejected the Pfizer and waited for the Sinopharm. Or some who rejected Sinopharm to wait for Sputnik or from Sputnik to AstraZeneca or AstraZeneca to Sinopharm. So what was very interesting for us that there are all, all possibilities, all combinations. Uh, people made all kinds of choices and it has uh, several aspects. So Pfizer and Moderna were the most popular in general, uh, but for some people, the, they didn't trust the RNA technology. So it's very new and not tested enough and so on. Uh, Sputnik and AstraZeneca was the vector, uh, vector vaccine. So different technology. Uh, also, the, the orig country of origin mattered to many people. Some trusted uh, only the one in the European framework and so on. But we can see there are all, all kinds of possible opinions were present. And interestingly, we can also even see loops. So there were some people, for example, here who rejected the AstraZeneca first, but some weeks later they were okay and took AstraZeneca. So we also monitored vaccine effectiveness uh, in, in real time for these uh, six or five types of vaccines without, uh, again, Johnson & Johnson was not included in the analysis. And basically that confirmed what it was seen elsewhere that uh, RNA vaccines had the highest efficacy and the waning was uh, more moderate than the waning for others. So about mathematical modeling. So at first we used some versions of this, it's kind of standard compartmental model. We had several compartments with different disease severity, uh, hospitalization here, critical condition. We also have these chains, uh, chains of cleaner, chains of compartments to account for gamma distributed time periods in different disease stages, latency and so on. And it was also age structured. So because we had the age, age contact matrices, we could use the parametrized age structure model. So overall counting for roughly 200 equations. And after the first wave, so during the first wave, we had very strict measures. Epidemic was suppressed. And there was the question was after relaxation, what's going to happen? So this uh, paper was concerned about these scenarios. And basically we compared three possibilities for different strengths of control measures. And also with different combination of control measures, it's not in the, in the figure. Uh, and basically what was we call the moderate control, uh, this one, Actually, this is what actually happened later with hospitalization peaking around 8,000 in the second wave. So we also had this study about uh, using predictive control to construct uh, kind of optimal intervention scheduling or planning using this uh, cost function when we also assigned costs for U was uh, strength of intervention. So reduction in contact, basically MPIs, uh, hospitalization and that also has assigned costs. And to see what with different weights, we can have different 
uh, optimal optimal uh, plant control. So what we find basically is that if you if you assign large weights to health related burdens like hospitalization and deaths, then what you get is what most countries did. Like in, you can see the stringency index in the left, like very strong measures at the beginning and then slowly relaxing. It was also a constrained optimization problem because we constrained uh, hospitalization by hospital capacity and also we constrained contract reduction. It could not go down to zero, of course. And the interesting thing was that when uh, we, we designed an optimal control for a six month period, so that was our time horizon. And of course, if you don't, if this is your time horizon, this finite time horizon, then at the end, uh, the optimal control will leave, uh, will let the epidemic to grow at the end because the costs of this growth are beyond the time horizon, actually. So this is what you give as, opti as uh, optimal control, and this produces these curves. And it was not never meant to be a pred prediction or so, sort of, but later, actually, exactly the same thing happened. So. Basically, the, the infection curve here is the purple one, and daily infected, daily cases here is the blue one. Uh, and this is exactly what happened. So it was suppressed epidemic, and after it was measures were relaxed, and after exactly after six months, you can see this uptick again, just like in the same magnitude, just like in this, this paper earlier. So one uh, example of when the A-structured model was very useful is to explain this situation, which in, in Hungary, it was called Florida effect. I don't know if they called it in other countries, uh, but basically uh, it was a situation when case numbers started to go up, but hospitalizations and deaths didn't go up yet. And of course we know that they are delayed, but it, this was longer than the, the, the delay between infection and hospitalization. And the reason behind it was this increase in case numbers first was mostly in socially active young adults who are very low risk of hospitalization or death. So it took several steps in the chain of infection, chain of infections to reach uh, more vulnerable populations. That's why this delay between increasing cases and increasing hospitalizations is actually much longer. And this could be very well explained and also predicted by A-stratified models using contact matrices, what we actually did. So here we, we could observe this. Most cases are in the age group of in people in their 20s, but in a few weeks, it will move to through the contact matrices between contact mixing between different age groups to other age groups. And very similar pattern was observed later. Uh, and of course, when it reached the elderly age groups as well, and kind of it was already in every age group, then we had increase in mortality. Basically, it was a very, in logarithmic scale, it's very nice if we average, we take a moving average, uh, weekly moving average, it's very nicely exponential, very, for very long time, actually, for us for uh, almost two months. So, and then this is the figure I'd show you in exponential pace. So this was 2024. And then in January, we had a decrease in case numbers, but we knew that alpha variant was there already. So the first warning that alpha variant we produced in January, early January, that even though cases going down, alpha variant will cause very soon a very large wave. And this purple was, uh, so our difficulty at this time was there was no, no good surveillance of the variants in Hungary. So we didn't know from there was no data how many of the cases actually alpha variant. So basically that's why you see these two extreme cases here plotted. This was another prediction from early March. This is also before um, a major point in, in governmental interventions. So this is just theoretical extreme points when all the cases we see here up to here at this time is every all is alpha variant or none are alpha variants. That would be 
extreme situations. Of course, we because we didn't have surveillance data for that, we tried to estimate or calibrate with other countries uh, which had similar travel patterns between UK and Hungary. Uh, Denmark had a very good surveillance system. So then based on this calibration, the purple curve that what we foreseen as the most likely. Uh, and it, it captured quite well. Also here in early March, also measures were introduced and you can see the dots, black dots here, the data later. And basically this you can attribute to the effect of measures that it became a bit smaller peak. So <clears throat> this figure, I show you, this was also used to communicate uh, to the public what's going on to explain. So this is a, it's a similar concept than uh, the state space in, uh, in dynamical systems. It's not exactly that, but something similar. Um, basically, we have here two indicators. One is the reproduction number, this axis, and hospital burden in the other axis. And if time goes on and events happen, of course, reproduction number is also continuously changing. Hospital burden can also go up, can go down. It's also changing. So then in time, we move in this plane. And this way we can explain what happened. So this is the story of the first three waves in Hungary. So that the first case, then we had reproduction number larger than two at that time, but then people stayed home, contact numbers reduced drastically by 80%, 70%. So reproduction number dropped below one, first wave was suppressed. And here came the summer. And after, after summer, again, contact numbers went back. Uh, to, to some extent, uh, epidemics start to grow, hospitalization went up, and then it was the first government intervention that reduced the reproduction number, but not to below one. So we could see even after interventions, even after intervention effects, we had still an increasing uh, phase. And then we peaked and we, had, we, we went down. But here appeared the alpha variant. So as alpha variant at higher and higher proportion among more cases, because the overall reproduction number is weighted the average of the, of the ancestral type and alpha variant. Of course, reproduction number was increasing, uh, but for a while hospitalization was still decreasing. And there was this turning point and we come up here with a higher hospitalization as before. And again, government made other interventions, but was still not strong enough to push reproduction number to below one. So we were still peaked at the higher level. And then here was the start of reopening. And then that's the time we were here when I, I prepared this chart for a, for a newspaper. So also we could we could capture quite well after, after a while the, the Delta wave uh, this was a prediction and that was the, the data afterwards. It was in this, this interval before seen. Uh, and also the Omicron wave, again, still for Omicron wave, even at that time, we still didn't have good surveillance for variants. Uh, but after uh, when Omicron took over, of course, we could by modeling reconstruct what the fraction of Omicron cases were in the past, and that was also in the in the news. It was very different from what was uh, reported. And I show you another approach now, which we used, and we compared, try to compare uh, results on different modeling approaches. We had another team at another university developing this agent-based model of Seged. So this is the map of our city. And you can see this uh, dots of different colors here. And the colors denote different locations, different types of locations, residential, uh, workplaces, healthcare facilities, schools, and so on. And the size of the dot denotes how many people are there at that location at a given time. So we are, a time is going on here. We were in the night, everything was blue. And then people wake up, went to work, went to school. Uh, yellow is the school and so on. And so this is a kind of, we, so we have this rhythm of the city. We even see some uh, 
there's a popular restaurant up up here so in the evening you can see many people who show up there yes and they went for lunch and we can see more for dinner they're going for dinner yes so this includes almost 185,000 agents and uh, those who live or commute live in the city or commute to work in the city with a very a high resolution of the demography, so where they live. Uh, we get, there are 3,000 different locations from Seged, schools, workplaces, encoded here. So with a 10 minute temporal resolution, we have this daily routine of the city simulated. And then of course you can start an epidemic by infecting some of your agents. And if, as they move around to different locations, they can infect the agents at the same location. So this is a this is a very flexible framework. So you can you can uh, compare or investigate very fine measures, which will be very difficult or impossible in a compartmental model setting, even on level of schools, which schools to close in the city, uh, which close which schools to open, and so on. And this is uh, published in this paper. So one other thing was also at the influence decision making is uh, what protocol to follow giving the second dose of AstraZeneca. So first, as many many countries, most countries also Hungary followed started the, the four weeks protocol. So second dose came four weeks after the first dose of AstraZeneca. Uh, but some countries, for example, UK, already started with the twelve. 12 weeks protocol. So they give the second dose only after 12 weeks. So what's the, what's the reason, what's the possible advantages to give it after 12 weeks? Uh, so, uh, of course, at that period, and this is concerned with the period when we have shortage of vaccines. So vaccines were continuously coming up to Hungary, but that time demand was much higher than available vaccines. Uh, so it was a strategic question how to use this limited amount of vaccines. So when you use the 12 weeks protocol, then the advantage of that is that you can give one dose to more people earlier. So after four, once somebody gets a shot after four and after four weeks, instead of giving these people the this person the second shot, you can give this the same unit of vaccine to another person as a first shot. So then you have, instead of one person with two shots, you have two persons with one shot, one more from four weeks uh, before. So to compare these two strategies, of course you need to know what is the level of immunity you have after a given time, at a given time after first dose and after a given time of second dose. And then when this, this data came up, out from the UK, we could make this simple calculation, basically in the two scenarios, to calculate the, the population level of immunity, just summing up basically the immunity of all the people who received one dose, two dose, and so on. And uh, assuming the uh, that the availability of AstraZeneca will be as it was planned for Hungary, we could make this calculation that what would be the population level immunity. Uh, and this is the four weeks protocol and the purple is the 12 weeks protocol. And you can see at the beginning, we have a substantial difference between population level immunity here. And this is what we call immunity gain, this area between the two. And then at this time, there was still significant circulation of the virus at, as well from the third wave. So it really mattered that we could get at this critical period 40% uh, more population level immunity gained from the AstraZeneca. So then uh, after high level meeting again, they changed the protocol in Hungary and switched from four weeks to 12 weeks. So this is the, the structure, how we, uh, uh, how we envisioned how this whole system, including modeling, forecasting, scenario analysis, 
should be coupled with uh, with surveillance, uh, uh, epidemiological assessment, and decision models. And we couldn't really achieve this fully, but that was what we were trying to uh, establish. So maybe I, I like to show this letter because when uh, uh, European director of WHO visited Hungary and he was impressed by this uh, task force, he wrote, wrote a very nice letter uh, about the modeling, praising the modeling work that has been done in Hungary. And finally, I, I'd like to show some examples. And this is kind of this, uh, to show you this section, is a bit inspired by, motivated by a workshop that was I was attending at Fields Institute in uh, August, an eco mathematical ecology and epidemiology workshop. And then after one talk, there was this discussion about predictive value, predictive power of the mathematical models. And it was a kind of, I didn't want to continue the, the debate there or start the debate there because we were running late at the conference, but it was, what was discussed was a bit pessimistic uh, views there that mathematical models are very useful to understand the, the give insights and understand the, the mechanisms governing the dynamics, but not as not so good as giving uh, good predictions about what will happen in COVID. So I I collected now. I mentioned some of the some of these predictions in the in the talk before, but here I uh, to to turn the, about to turn it into a much more optimistic uh, <laughs> uh, view than than I have I've seen at the workshop. I collected ten examples here when I compare what others said and I compare what the task force said, and and by others. I didn't want to specify who was that because for different peoples and different organizations for different examples, but there were all, always there were some some influential voices who were heard in the public discourse, and many people uh, accepted this what others said in the view. So, for example, there was a debate in the first wave because we had uh, limited testing and it was unclear how large the outbreak actually was and how many people got infected in the first wave. And then many said that more than 10% of the population already contracted the disease. So a task force said it's up to 1%. Up to and then there was a large scale seroprevalence and find 0.6%. So some other examples. Prior to the first wave, it was commonly believed that the virus will not cause large, it was not not so commonly believed, but some, some influential people said that this is a, this virus can cause an epidemic in, uh, in Asia and in some other places, but it will not cause large epidemic in Europe and will not, not reach Hungary. So of course, this, this travel <clears throat> models clearly showed it will reach Hungary. So in 22 summer, we had very low case numbers. Many said there will be no second wave. And of course, modeling showed the relax. Okay, in summer you have seasonality, but after a very large second wave. And then when we started to see more and more cases in August, then, then it was very common in the media that this is not second wave. We only see more cases because we test more people than before. While we said it's just it's the beginning of a large wave, which it turned out to be. And in, in late August, there was a view to close the borders. We should close the borders to keep the virus out. And the government actually closed the borders end of August. But then modeling showed that now it's to, at this point, border closure will not change, give any significant change how the wave will play out from now on. Uh, so they closed the borders. And of course, the wave just swept through. Uh, also, 2020 September, I, this is, I mentioned the Florida effect case. Case numbers went up. Hospitalizations and deaths were still low. So many people think, okay, just cases, it's a, a case demic or something like that was the phrase. So there's no problem here. Hospitalization deaths don't go up. So then, of course, 
uh, age structured model that show deaths will increase significantly in October. You just have to wait until it reaches vulnerable population. And that's exactly what happened. October case numbers started to grow exponentially. I mean, that's, that's also started to grow exponentially. Uh, there was a case in ma ma major news that we have good news, epidemic slowed down, reproduction number is near one, near one. While in fact, we just reached maximum testing capacity. So we said it didn't slow down. We just see roughly the same number of cases day by day, because that's how many you can uh, find. That's why it's just, uh, it's not, reproduction number is not one. Just it seems to be because of limitations, its limitations. And of course, later it was clear that hospitalizations uh, started to go up, that it was the case. Okay, then in January, when cases were going down, but alpha variant is there in the background, but it was not clear how many or what it will cause. And then the general attitude for the whole country was that now we can finally reopen. Cases going down in January. Uh, what we said, alpha variant, the parameters of alpha variant, we will have a huge wave in a few weeks. And we have this week wave, even if we don't relax any measures, we keep the same measures. So same measures were kept, and of course, alpha variant caused a huge wave. And also then later, when alpha, alpha wave started to go down, government started reopening, first terraces, uh, people can have uh, drinks and so on, and then later schools and other places. And there was a kind of general panic that it reopening will be disastrous. But we modeling showed it will slow down the decay a bit, but it will not cause a new wave this spring reopening. And then in 2021 summer, it was general view that we had two large waves and we had many people 60% vaccinated. So there will be no force wave for sure. But if you use delta variant parameters, it was modeling showed there will be a force wave by delta and it happened so and it was even uh media also noticed this so there was this article in a major uh, major news site about this uh the raging third epidemic wave it was proven again the model of the team works basically, and it was a long article about these things that I, I examples and uh, things I mentioned. Okay, so I think it was quite clear that, that modeling contributed a lot for predictions, give very good predictions in a sense, not in the sense that I can give, uh, I can tell you on a given day exactly how many people are in hospitals, for some, some periods of the epidemic, even that was possible, but no, clearly not in, in the general or in longer term. But if you consider predictions in this, uh, in this sense, uh, what the major things are going to happen, we have a large wave. Uh, we will don't have and it, uh, uh, the magnitudes of things or the directions of the uh, direction of the pandemic. I think it was, it was very often showed correctly by modeling when major uh, other views were the opposite. So these are some of the many papers published by the task force, of course, so it's two period, two, more than two years. So here are an incomplete uh, list. And finally, I go in the end of the talk to this Canadian story shortly. So, this is just about my personal uh, uh, past. So there was this book, I showed the cover of this book, co-authored by Zhang Wu, because it's also co-authored by my supervisor, Tipo Christian from University of Seged. So I also, my, my PhD was, was uh, kind of a bit related to this book about uh, global dynamics of delay differential equations and that's how I got in, in touch with Zhang Wu in the first place by mathematical aspects of delay differential equations. And then, of course, you maybe you remember, uh, surely you remember the SARS outbreak, which hit Canada, and then the MITEX group network was formed, multidisciplinary group for uh, modeling 
infectious diseases. And so when I finished my PhD and there was the MITEX group that gave me the opportunity to be a postdoctoral fellow with Jahong at York University in 2006 and seven. And then uh, that's where I learned about mathematical epidemiology. I, never, I didn't know anything about it before I coming to Canada. Uh, I never heard of SIR model or anything like that before. And uh, then in uh, returning back to Hungary, I could get this significant grant when I could start the first disease modeling group in Hungary. And then basically that was forming the basis on which we could build the COVID-19 modeling task force. And now uh, for more recent news, the task force is stopped functioning uh, this March, but now we have another initiative called the National Laboratory for Health Security, which is uh, has a wider scope than the task force had. It's not only about COVID, but in, in general, uh, even, even larger. Uh, it includes now a significant uh, part of it is ecology. Uh, so it includes 150 researchers from 16 institutions in the country, and it's uh, the centrum, center of this Laboratories in Seged, and it's organized into four divisions. This is dynamics, ecological epidemiology, invasion biology, and data-driven health. And for it's funded, has good funding for the next four years, and it gives good opportunities for collaborations, international collaborations, and I hope also with Canadian researchers as well. And so at York University, uh, I still, Work with Jia Hong on uh, more theoretical aspects of delay different nonlinear delay equations, but also got involved in this influenza modeling papers. Uh, so, this was the result of this postdoctoral fellowship. And then later, I had many, I listed all my co authors, Canadian co authors. The ones with the bold are those who I, I worked very intensely. Uh, for example, with Ching Fuzo also won a fellowship to Hungary, a prestigious fellowship, spent uh, significant time here. I uh, worked a lot with, for example, Jane Heffernan. You can see here a photo with Jane in a Maple Leafs game. And also from Hungary, three of my PhD students went at some point to York University. Uh, maybe you, you know, some of you know them. And to, to acknowledge this uh, very fruitful connection, scientific collaborations between uh, York University and University of Seged, Jiaong was awarded this uh, Dr. Honoris Causa title uh, in 2016 at the University of Seged. Here you can see he's receiving this award, which was given by a rector of our university in the main building. So I'd like with this, I'd like to thank your attention. And I really hope these connections between Fields Institute and our institute will just be stronger in the coming coming years. Oh, thank you. Thank you very much, Gege, for, for the, um, recording you a huge success in uh, in Canada and, uh, and the, the concluding uh, bridge between the Fields Institute and Boulder Institute is a very encouraging congratulation, by the way, for the uh, creation of the, the, the uh, National Laboratory of Health Security in Hungary. So that's a remarkable. Um, now we do have, uh, we allow people to ask questions. Uh, you can you can mute yourself and ask a question directly. 